I'm in. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Go. I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. So, folks, um, I'm Kirsty. I'm Uni's brand manager, and I'm here with Mike, who is um, more commonly known as Rose Hill Sourdough, That's but me. he's also our head of engineering um, at Uni. Um, so, we've gathered all your sourdough questions. Thank you very much for submitting them. Um, we're going to show you some, some cool things tonight. Mike is going to cook something awesome, sourdough related, otherwise, what's the point? That's right. Um, <laughs> And uh, he's going to be using Coda, uh, Unicoda 16 tonight. So, um, yeah, so you'll get to see the, the, the beauty all fired up with that L-shaped burner. Um, really, you know, we're in lockdown just now and the sourdough train is just not slowing down. It just Amazing. seems to be gathering pace. Um, I had a wee look on Google Trends earlier on and it started to kind of um, take that upward upward climb around about the 8th of March and it peaked around April 11th and it's just, it's just staying there. It's yeah, just it's not so cool. away at all. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Mike, who's going to kind of talk you through what he's going to make tonight, um, and then we'll go on to some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, welcome, everybody. Yes. Um, hello, I'm Mike. Welcome to my backyard. Um, I have an amazing Uni Pizza Ovens tent up because it is raining. <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> We're not going to let it slow us down. Um, so yeah, I've got Uni uh, Coda 16 fired up in the background. Um, with that L-shaped burner. Oh, I got the angle pretty good on that, actually. Nice. That's pretty good. Um, so I'm going to be doing a focaccia in Unicoda 16 tonight, and I will tell you why. Um, so like Kirsty mentioned, um, the sourdough trend has just blown up, which is amazing. People have time at home. They're jumping into their hobbies. Um, and one of the things that people love um, to do right now is bake. And I, I love it because this is a time that people have kind of slowed down, have some reflection and nothing teaches you more patience um, and causes you to slow down like learning to bake with sourdough um, because you have to, you have to give it time. Uh, the dough that I'm going to be using tonight, um, I started, there we go. Hello. Nice. Um, I started this morning um, about 6.30 in the morning. Uh, I started it. And so it's been going for almost 14 hours um, and it's going to be a, a nice, thick, bubbly focaccia. So we're going to start, start there. So, um, I'm going to be doing it in Unicoda 16. Um, we, I'm going to launch the pizza. I'm going to show you how I'm baking it in Unicoda 16. And then we're going to jump into some sourdough questions. Um, I've got my two cultures here, Nona and Lucille, if you've been following on Instagram, um, so we can answer questions about that. You guys have submitted a bunch of questions, so we'll get into those. Um, and if we don't get it to them all we have them written down and we will respond to them so um please watch out for those and i believe we also are recording this so that it'll be posted later a couple people have already asked that so yes we are. yeah uh, we are recording it great so uh, i'm just going to jump right into it so if you are starting um this kind of sourdough journey um yes damn, thank you mike's instagram rose Hill sourdough that's me <laughs> rose like the flower hill like a small mountain and sourdough like really like really sourdough yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> um so in the beginning when i'd say rose hill sourdough i'd say it so fast people thought my name was russell and i was saying russell sourdough not russell it's mike rose hill sourdough so um i've got my focaccia here so like i said i i got this going um early this morning uh to get that going early this morning i had to feed my culture last night um, and I made my focaccia recipe in here. It's an 80% hydration dough. We'll get into percentages and what that means in a little bit, um, but it's a nice wet dough, um, and it's very airy. You can see there's nice big bubbles and stuff in there. You can see the oil floating around. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to wet my hands, put a little oil on this dough, and I'm going to stretch it out to the corners, um, and I'm going to get under the dough and make sure it's not sticking or anything, make sure there's a lot of good oil under there, uh, and I'm going to launch it in Unicoda 16. So uh, let me just start with that there. Cool. Um, I might ask you a couple of questions Please while you're do. doing that, if that's okay. Um, first one is, why is there water on my sourdough starter? Um, yes. I'm, a, I'm a sourdough novice. Um, I, I've, got, I've got a culture that seems to be doing okay, touch wood. But at the start, I had quite a bit of water on the top. And that's a qu common question that we've had. Yeah. So a lot of people, when they first start, um, that's totally normal, by the way. And it's not just water. So fermentation, it, the same yeast that's in sourdough is the same that's used for baking, uh, sorry, for brewing beer. That's alcohol that's on top of your starter. Um, don't drink it. It's ethanol. I don't know if that's what made people go blind during prohibition. Maybe. 
I just tell people, dump it off. Don't drink it. Don't even try. Um, so the ethanol that's created from the fermentation is ethanol vapor that's going to go uh, up into the jar and kind of settle, might condense, and then go back down to the top. Just dump that out. I've gotten so many questions of people who it's all the same script. It's like, day three, it looks so great. And then all of a sudden, like day four, day five, it stopped working. The problem that people have is what they do is, is they mix that, that alcohol back in. Uh, there might be some acid up in there too. It is sourdough. It's making lactic acid and acetic acid. Um, they might be mixing that back into the sourdough starter when they're starting. So they're going and they're just looking at it like, oh, this looks good. They dump some more flour and some more water on top. They mix it all back up. What you just did was chemically weaken your starter by mixing that alcohol and acid back in. So dump that out um, and always make sure you feed to the same ratio. Okay. okay. Um, so one, two, two is what I feed. Uh, and that's what I teach one part starter, two parts water, two parts flour. Um, so it's always hundred percent hydration and then you just keep going from there. So, um, okay. so yeah, so that's what that clear liquid is on top. It's not water. There might be some water in there, but it's going to be alcohol vapor, um, that you want to just pour off the top of okay. that. Okay. Just on, just on ratios, we had another question yeah. about kind of weekly feeding ratios. Um, and yes. obviously there's some people out there who feed at one to one, one. Yes. One to a half to a half and you're one to two to two. So what's, yes. what's, what are the pros and cons for that? Yes. Yeah, so the reason why I feed one to two is, is something called uh, over like two, one, one or one, one, one. Um, you carry over more of that acid that I was talking about. The lactic acid makes acid. And so the more you put in that next feed, then the more that's in it when that feed starts and you can chemically weaken your starter. Um, so what you can do, why I feed one, two, two is the math's are really easy. One plus two plus two is five. So I know if I need to feed up hundred grams of starter, I just divide by five and that's 20. I start with 20 and then 40 grams of water, 40 grams of flour, and I've got hundred grams of starter. So I like one, two, two, it limits the acid carryover and it's really easy. You can feed up to one, five, five and really not have any issues. I have been told, I, I talked to um, some people at the sourdough library and they said that Sometimes feeding over 155, you can risk changing the kind of composition of the sourdough. Um, but feeding at 122, that's just my sweet spot. Um, so anywhere really between 122 and 155, you limit last carryover and get a really good um, sourdough culture. It's going to stay really healthy. So um, there's my there's my my focaccia dough um, sliding around because I, I work my fingers around under it. Um, and you can see that it's, it's nice and airy. I lift it up out of the pan here. It's nice and stretchy. I'm just giving it a really gentle stretch and just folding it back in down into those corners. Um, and you can see all the bubbles that are forming on that. So like I said, um, I'm such an old man trying to like angle this up <laughs> into the camera. I could just use the tripod for what it's there for and pull that down. Hey, look at that. Woo! There we go. Okay, cool. So there we go. Nice and bubbly um, sourdough focaccia dough. Then now I'm just, I call this dimpling. Some people call it docking. Um, and the reason why you do that is because if I just left this dough, I say really good pizza starts with really good bread. This is really good bread. If I just left this bread and baked it, it would bake like a loaf of bread and have this big dome on the top. So the reason I'm docking it or dimpling it is to make little tiny loaves of bread um, that all raise up kind of the same height um, together. And so they're not making this big loaf of bread because I don't want that. I want a one sheet of uniform thickness. Mm. So I'm docking it um, to get to that. So I've got it. Um, I'm coming over to Unicoda 16. This thing is hot, um, has not been on for long. I'm gonna turn it off. There's enough heat stored in the stone and in that oven that it's gonna bake this focaccia. So okay. uh, I'm just gonna check my center stone temperature here. I'm at 350 degrees C. That's exactly where I wanna be for this bake. Um, and for reference here, that's about 650 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to pop that in and I'm going to push it all the way back to the far left corner. I know this is really difficult to see on here, but the L shape, um, the far back left corner, that's where the kind of the hottest part of the stone is. I'm pushing that all the way back into that corner and I'm just going to set a quick timer here for five minutes okay. and then after five minutes i'm going to turn it there's enough heat in that oven like i said it's going to bake that sourdough focaccia almost all the way through and then after 10 minutes total we're going to take it out and i'm going to show you how to finish it whether you want to finish it as a focaccia or the thing i'm going to do tonight is make a detroit style pizza 
um, which is one of my absolute favorites. I've made it in all of our ovens. Um, I love Detroit style. It is a really thick crust pizza and it's known for these tight corners. Um, and it's got this little bit of a draft angle on the, on the pan and you fill the corners up with cheese and then the cheese melts against the side of the pan so and we good. take this thing out. It's amazing. And I am looking around realizing I forgot my spatula. So we'll have to go in there in about 20 minutes and grab that. <laughs> um, but it's about a 20 minute bake. So while this is baking, we've got 20 minutes just to, to chat cool. sourdough. So you want to hit with the next question? Yeah, I do indeed. Um, if you've got some, if you've got some dough there, I would like to see how to yes. fold it. Yes. So that's a question that comes up quite a lot. You know, how, how do you fold the dough? Yeah. Let me bring you over here. So, um, got a couple of doughs here. So this is, um, this is dough that is only an hour old. So I, I made this dough um, just an hour ago and you can see it is not a smooth dough ball. When people go to try to make this recipe for the first time, I get so many questions like, I tried to knead it and my it's stuck everywhere. I must've done something wrong. That's impossible to knead, you can't knead it. You're right, 80%. Uh, is, is really hard to work with if you've never worked with it before. That's why it's such a great beginner recipe because sourdough loaves, like if you're making a bowl or if you're making, um, if you're trying to shape baguette for the first time or something, uh, it's difficult to work with that high of a percentage with dough if you're new to this. The nice thing about focaccia is it sits in a pan. You don't have to worry about getting this really tight, amazing dough um, with really great structure. You can just work with the pan and it, fills out the pan and then it makes a really amazing fluffy dough. So I've got this 80% hydration dough. All that means is that it's 80% water um, to flour. So if you see baker's percentages and recipes, just know that it's just a percentage. Everything is relates back to the amount of water in the dough. Um, I'm just giving my hands just a very light uh, dip of water. So what I teach is like this fingertip method where you just kind of just put your fingertips right down in the water and that's it. Rub your hands together. That's plenty of water for your hands. You don't want to be soaking wet. And all it's going to do is help the dough not stick to your fingers. So I'm going to do a first fold on this, which is a stretch and fold. I'm going to literally going to stretch the dough out and fold the back. Now notice on my fingertips where there's dough sticking, there's nothing below my second knuckle. A lot of people just go in and grab the dough. And they're like, why is it all stuck to my hand? <laughs> second knuckle is where you want to be. So everything above there, you don't want to go below the second knuckle when you're touching the dough. So I'm just going to go in here and lift up and fold back over, stretch and fold, stretch and fold. And I'm gonna go all the way around the dough. How's that um, angle, what, Percy? Can what, you see that okay? Yeah, that, that angle okay, is right. perfect. And what, what sort of consistency does it feel, you know, if you could if you could compare it to another material, what does it feel like? Uh, it's a little like bit like thick paste. Okay. Um, it's, you can kind of see it here. It's not very thin like it is doughy but mm. it's not like a batter like it shouldn't feel battery it shouldn't feel like it's not coming together at this point this is only an hour old um it shouldn't look perfectly smooth um it shouldn't have super great strength you can see that it's tearing a little bit mm. all i'm doing right now is building some structure in the dough i'm forming what i call a smooth side and a seam side to the dough so i'm going to flip this over and now I've just established a smooth side and a seam side to my dough. I'm just going to give that a really light shaping like that. This is not a smooth dough ball. It doesn't have to be at this point. I promise you it'll become a smooth dough ball. Okay. All I've got now is a smooth side on top and a seam side on bottom. Put a lid on it. I let it sit for an hour. If people, people generally, when they start making, um, bread, even lower percentage stuff, if they've, if they've never really worked with dough before, they complain that the dough is too sticky. Um, and they have a really hard time handling it. Lightly wet hands, um, you don't really want to add a, a ton more flour to the dough. Really lightly wet hands will help keep the dough from sticking to your hands. Um, and then just, like I said, limited surface area. Um, you want to go from the, the finger, the second knuckle kind of up. You don't want to stick your whole hand in there. So limited surface area on your hand. Okay. Um, patience. <laughs> I, so many times I'll be teaching a class or something. And someone's like, oh, this is just not working. My number one trick, if the dough is too sticky and it's not stretching, cover it, go grab a glass of wine, sit for 15 minutes, come back. It will work. I promise you it'll work. Um, just take some time. Oh, and there's my timer. Sweet. All right. So that's been five minutes. That was a great little 
planned five cool. minute time right there. That was incredible. That worked that out took perfectly. Exactly five minutes. Just a just a quick question. Like yeah. what what kind of flour are you using for the focaccia? Ah, that's an excellent question. So uh, five minutes, I just turned it 180 degrees and putting it back in that far left corner and things start again. So um, I teach most of my recipes use bread flour. I get that bread flour is really limited right now. and People have a hard time finding higher protein flours. The flour I'm using actually right now is Caputo Double O, um, which is a high protein, fine grind, fine milled uh, pizza dough flour. Um, but I'm using it for the the focaccia, it's, it absorbs a lot of water. It's got a good protein in it. Um, so it has really good structure. All purpose flour. When I, when I first learned to make pizza, I was in Florence with my wife and my parents in a uh, pizza making class. And I remember the guy saying, I asked him what kind of flour we're using. And he said, bread flour. And I said, can I make this with all purpose? And in his like broken Italian English, it was so perfect. He's like, all purpose is okay for everything, but it's good for nothing. <laughs> and I was like, it's such a good description of all-purpose flour because it is. It's okay to mm-hmm. make pizza and stuff with all purpose. What I tell people is with all purpose, just pull the water down a little bit. Remember I, I mentioned percentages earlier? So an 80% dough, you might want to pull down to like 75% and give that a try. All of this stuff, if you've messaged me on Instagram and I've gotten back to you, message me on, on YouTube, I try to respond to all you guys. There's a lot of you. I try to get back to you as much as I can. When, when there's questions that are like, can I try this? Or can I, would this work? Can I put this in the refrigerator? Can I do this? Try it. Just try it. Like that's the beauty of this process. As long as you keep feeding your sourdough, this sourdough was started in 1849. Like as long as you keep feeding it, it's going to last forever. You're not like, just give it a go. If it doesn't work, at least you've got bread. Like, even yeah. if it's burnt, you can tear the burnt stuff off and eat the center. Like, it's still got bread. Just try it and then learn from that. Take some notes and try it differently the next time. So with all purpose, give like 3 to 5% less water. Give it a try. If it's still too sticky, it's not coming together. It's just not absorbing enough of that water. Okay. Um, drop the water and try it again. Cool. Thank you yeah. very much. Mm-hmm. Um, another question. If I want to store my sourdough in the fridge for a week, should I yeah. feed it and then put it in the fridge straight away? Or should I leave it to rise for a while before refrigerating? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, you should let it rise. And here's, okay. here's why I teach that. So um, whenever I feed sourdough, I really like this style jar because there's loose lids. Okay. Um, so when I feed it, I let it double. I fed this this morning. Um, and you can see you know, like when you, when you go to like a wine tasting class the first time and they're like, like, Oh, swirl the wine and watch the legs. Right. And it's like, <laughs> you like see the level. That's the exact same thing with this. Like I can tell that my sourdough made it to that level because I start with a clean jar and then it's got some legs. So I know it's settled down to there. So I, I start, I got about a two and a half, three X rise on this because it started about here and I got it up to there and now it's on its way back down again. That is important. It's going to do that. When you feed it, it's going to double or triple you want to grab it once it's doubled or tripled. That's when you're going to make dough out of it. If you don't want to make dough, that's fine. If you're just maintaining your starter, I, I teach to try to maintain it weekly. If you're just maintaining your starter, you got a busy week. Great. Take it out of the fridge, show it some love, give it a feeding, wait for it to come back down. 24 hours. It should take depends on how cold it is. Again, it goes back to my note on just try it. Everyone's starter is going to act a little differently. Even my two starters, exact same conditions, exact same water. Nona goes a little bit slower. The older one, she goes a little bit slower than Lucille. It goes a little bit faster. So you just have to learn it. So wait for it to come all the way back down. Once it's back down to its original volume, seal it, pop it in the fridge. Ah, now that's another question. Yeah. Um, because there's a bit of a debate between yeah. sealing your jar properly and putting it in the fridge or leaving the jar slightly ajar. Yes. Um, so what's, what's the best, what's the best way of, of, what are the differences? Yeah. So that's a really good question. So, um, fermentation and was what is what hap- is what's happening in this jar, right? So there's some wild yeast that's in there, um, and it's eating the sugars and it's creating carbon dioxide and alcohol and it's fermenting this flour. Okay. It's the exact same process that beer and wine goes through. Um, there's a second thing with sourdough that makes sourdough special and that's the lactic acid bacteria that's the really cool stuff. That's the magic of this is the lactic acid bacteria then starts to work on that gluten structure that got, got uh, made. That's why with sourdough, why it raises and why it drops back down. It raises because it's building structure and it's burping and making all this carbon dioxide, filling all these little balloons up. It raises 
and then it starts to lose structure and starts to fall back down. And that structure is because the, the bacteria and the um, yeast start eating itself basically. And then it drops back down. So that lactic acid bacteria, that's the magic that's happening. Both of those, pro um, those processes can happen aerobically or anaerobically. So with oxygen, without oxygen. So really you don't need air in the jar. And there's my five minute timer. You don't need in air in the jar. Um, so you can, you can tighten it and leave it and it will be fine because it can use, uh, it can, it can metabolize anaerobically, okay. but I like to teach leaving it open. And there's a couple reasons. One, I really don't like building pressure in a glass jar. I used to home brew and I made a bad batch of beer one time and all my bottles busted because I over primed and it was a crazy mess. And so now I'm just, I don't like the idea of sealing up a jar when I know I'm creating carbon dioxide and alcohol and that thing. And it's just going to pressurize. I've seen people's jars break uh, mm. because they don't leave enough headroom in it and it pressurizes. So I just don't like that. The second reason I don't like it is because there's alcohol vapor that's coming off of it. If I leave it to breathe, I give that chance and al that alcohol vapor a chance to get out. Uh, if I seal it, the alcohol vapor can condense and then settle back down. And that's higher chance of you just mixing that back in. Okay. So that's again, why I teach loose when you're feeding and then tighten to go in the fridge. Um, the tightening to go in the fridge is because that yeast, the whole point of going in the fridge, the yeast is going to start to slow down. The lactic acid bacteria is going to get activated and that's going to go to work. That doesn't need as much oxygen that being tight. Um, is just, it's not going to pressurize cause it's not going to be creating the CO2. It's going to be creating lactic acid. So it's a different kind of experience that's happening. So just tighten it up top. Uh, pop it in the fridge, but wait until it's come back down before you tighten it. And then, yeah, fridge a week, two weeks. I've used stuff that's been a month old and it's been fine. Oh. The last time I fed this, I felt so bad for Nona. She probably sat in there for six months, but she's old and she's strong. <laughs> she can handle it. Um, she's all right. And she's all right. So it's been 10 minutes now. Um, so I'm just going to grab my pizza out here. Probably put a glove on. This is going to be hot. Now, if so I... We yeah, go for it. I was just going to say that we, we had a question about um, how to make pretty patterns on top of loaves of pretty sourdough. Pretty patterns. Ooh, yeah, yeah I, I can get into that. I know exactly what, what they're referencing there. So let me show you this before I go any further. So if I wanted to finish this now um, as a focaccia, I would basically just need to get some color on the top. It's almost done baking. Um, that's, that was all with just the residual heat in the stone and in the oven. I, I, that flame wasn't on that whole time. So now to get the color, I would turn the flame back on and heat it back up and then get some color on the top and finish baking it. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to top this thing and we're going to make it a Detroit style pizza. So let me bring in here and let's give this thing a top and I'll talk about uh, pretty designs on, on sourdough. So um, people love, um, scoring bread that's what that's called um to do that you need a really really sharp razor blade um there's a few different options i like one that is a little round one um they're made in the united states this guy wire monkey shop um his name's tyler's a really nice guy and he used to make them by hand i think he probably still does make them by hand um but they're little round guys and they have a little razor blade in them that gets you nice and close to the surface you don't need that when i started i'm just gonna hit this with a little butter by the way um just because uh, the pan's hot and it just melts the butter into the crust. If I was doing this from a Detroit from the very beginning, I might do a little bit more butter in the, in the actual dough, like more mm -hmm. of a traditional like butter crust than olive oil. Um, so I just like to top it. If I was doing a focaccia, I wouldn't do this extra step here. Uh, but this is just because I'm doing Detroit style dough and I can't get brick cheese here, which has a really high butter fat content. Um, because I don't border a great lake. Um, and that's really the only States you can get brick cheese in. Um, so because I can't get that here, I'm just, I do a little bit of butter and then I use a mild cheddar. If you can get Monterey Jack, um, like a COVID I live in Southern California, that's easy. Grab some Monterey Jack, throw it on there. Um, if you can't, then mild cheddar. I like to do cubed mild cheddar. Make sure you get it down in the corners. That's the most important part. Yeah. Um, you can also use a mix of, um, grated mozzarella and grated cheddar as well, can't you? Yes, yes. So I, I like to do the cube. I don't know why I like the cube. It just kind of has this like very Detroit like style esqueness to it with brick mm. cheese and like using this like cubed up brick cheese. Um, and then I do hit it with some um, shredded mozzarella here. So this is 
uh, not fresh mozzarella. This isn't fiorda latte or anything like that. It's just standard out of the bag um, shredded mozzarella. If you can find it, I like to use whole milk mozzarella and not part skim. Um, that's harder to find here. I, I don't know why. Um, in the States, it's difficult to find too, but if you really look for it, Chargento has some, you can find some whole milk mozzarella. That's really good. It's just got a higher fat content. A lot of cheaper mozzarellas, like you buy in the bag that are, um, like, you know, exactly the ones I'm talking about, like the inexpensive, they have just very low fat content, so much water in them and they just brown right away. They don't give you like any time to really do anything with it. Um, it just browns and burns higher the fat. It's going to keep from burning. So, uh, I'm throwing that in right in the front right of the oven so remember before i was in the back left um and i was cooking in the back left with some of that residual heat from the stone now i'm moving it to the front right and i'm turning all the way down to low and i'm going to set a timer here for five minutes perfect and i'm just going to come back and check on it so every once in a while all i'm doing right now is just melting those toppings and getting some some color on the crust um, and i'll pull that out when it's done and i will get to eat Detroit style pizza, and I'm so sorry that no, you will be able to it's eat right. Detroit style pizza. Fraser, Fraser just commented and said that's yeah. the thing he misses most about being <laughs> in the office. <laughs> oh, not my hugs! Come on, Fraser. Oh well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so you've got a you've got a Detroit style pan in yeah. Uni Coda 16. Um, yes. Could you fit a Dutch oven in in an Uni oven? Yeah. So I love. <sighs> for whatever reason, my oven just doesn't get hot here. Like my indoor kitchen oven. Um, I love baking bread in Uni Pro because my Dutch oven fits in there so well. Recently, I've been doing this trick where I've been taking my two quart uh, cast iron Dutch oven and I'll put it in Coda 16 just to preheat it because I know it'll get really, really hot. And then I'll take it out and drop my bread in there, cap it and throw it in the uh, my oven inside that is claiming to be 430 C, but there's no way that it's actually that hot. So I like to get it screaming hot. Um, when I bake the bread, because that just gives it this really great, it's called oven spring. Um, and it's the exact same thing that makes pizza so amazing in all of our uni products because you have the intense heat and what's happening. We call it like the uni effect is what happens is that intense heat hits those gases. We talked about the CO2 and there's some water vapor that are trapped. We're making little bubbles, remember? So we're making little bubbles in the dough. All those little bubbles are filled with CO2 and, and water vapor. And when we hit that with super intense heat really quickly, it expands, it superheats the it's actual scientific name. It superheats the steam and it expands really, really quickly. And that's why we get these amazing, incredible, huge bubbles and this really cool crust um, in Neapolitan style pizzas because of that amazing heat. And you need to do that really quickly because think about it. If you don't do it really quickly, then the outer edge of that crust starts to bake and get crusty and hard. And those gases try to expand against it and they can't. And so you'll get like tears and rips in your dough. Mm. Now in bread, you want that. You want that expansion, those tears and rips. And so bringing this back to scoring, the reason why you score is to allow for that expansion. Now you can allow for that expansion in really specific ways. Uh, I'm just turning that around. I'm just going to be popping back there to turn around uh, every so often uh, to get it nice and evenly crusted um, and brown. But you can you can do it really, really beautiful ways. Um, there's, I'm not going to try to be in the same ballpark as some of these artists that are on Instagram and that just have incredible uh, skill when it comes to a razor blade on dough. Um, I have a few kind of signature ones that I like to do. One of the first ones I did was like wood grain. Um, I, I think I was, I don't know, I think me and my buddy Patrick were like making something out of wood and I got like inspired by wood grain and I tried to like carve that in bread. And then that kind of exploded as like this cool way to do it was this cool, like wood grain thing, which I liked it because it was nice and even. And so it all expanded all nice and evenly and I didn't get these yeah. like big tears. Um, but a very popular one is just a single um, quick uh, score kind of at an angle and then what happens is as it expands, because your final shape, you kind of pull in the sides. And so you're prepping the dough to expand in a certain way. So you do this, this cut and then the dough, dough kind of expands like this. And then it gets this like ear on top. Um, and so you'll see this like really pronounced ear in a lot of people's dough. And then along the side, I like to do a little like um, grain, like a little uh, wheat grain, which is a really cool little one because it's just a little score. So nice. it's fun to play with because you can do like different depths that'll give you different expansions. Um, and anyway, Sarah Marie is amazing. Yes, she is. That's my wife. She's incredible. 
<laughs> she answered all the questions I think in the live chat right now. Thank you. Um, where, um, where can someone get a sourdough starter that's been around the block, for example, Nona? Oh my gosh. So just start asking people, like if you bring up sourdough, like somebody has a cousin that's doing sourdough. And even now, like I bet your next door neighbor is making sourdough. Like that's why your shop doesn't have any flour right now um, because so many people are doing it. And they might've got it from a friend who got it from a friend who got it from a friend. So um, there's a few people on Instagram right now I know that are selling theirs. Um, when I was in the States, I would sell mine and, you know, send it around. I'm not doing that. Um, I need to do that. Uh, there's been quite a few people asking, but just like people have it and they'll give it away for free. It's like, I don't know if you ever did the old like Amish friendship bed that it was like annoying and you had to like pass it around to your friends and it made good bread and stuff. And that was kind of like sourdough, but it really wasn't. Someone has it. Someone's got a sourdough starter that's been sitting in their fridge. I've got a bunch of people in the States. If you write me and they're like, Hey, I live in um, the Bay area. Can I get a sourdough starter? Or I live in Missouri. I'm sure there's somebody that I know that has one of my starters in a random state and we could probably get you one. Um, but just ask, just ask sourdough mania. What up? That's crazy. <laughs> what? Hello. Hello. Um, so yeah, so just ask around. So I'm sure somebody's got one. I got Nona from a friend who got it from a friend who got it from a friend. That was the exact same thing. It was a buddy so of mine who started talking about sourdough with somebody and that's the story. A question linked to um, good old Nonna. Yes. Um, our, um, our, one of our uni ambassadors, Lewis Pope, asked yeah. a question yeah, about, yeah. Um, about, you know, an old starter. How can you say it's an old starter if we're constantly kind of feeding it? Is it kind of that culture that's already built uh, in there? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. That's exactly what it is. That's a really good question. I mentioned 155 feeding earlier, so I'll call back to that really quick. You can... If you feed it more aggressively than that, like 11010 or 12020, I teach a 12020 method for people who have had a sourdough sitting in the fridge for like months and they think they killed it. It's got black liquid on the top. They're extracting a tiny bit out of the bottom and they're trying to bring it back to life. I'll teach you a 12020 there. But for regular feedings, you want to stay under 155 because yes, you can change um, kind of the microbiome that's happening inside of that sourdough. All this is is yeast and bacteria and it's going to change by your region. Um, which is one of the coolest things is it actually changes just moving, uh, whether it's miles or thousands of miles, it's going to change. Um, I have had Nona, I fed her in a very specific way. I don't feed her at crazy high ratios because I'm trying to kind of maintain this Bay Area starter. Um, so I try to feed her at about one, two, two, and really don't push her any higher than that. Um, and it's, there's definitely a difference. Um, people ask, you know, is there a difference? I just did a long probably too long comparison, like multi post series on my Instagram showing Nona and Lucille in pizza and in focaccia and in bread. Um, and like all this stuff, just showing them kind of side by side and how they're different. Um, and I would say that they are absolutely different. They're structurally, they're different. Um, they, the flavor is subtly different, but it is different. And these are using the exact same flowers and everything when I, when I do the bake. So, um, I would say you can call it that old. I totally get what the question is because there's an argument to be made. It was like, well, if I feed mine every day versus you feeding yours every week, isn't mine like seven times older than yours? Do you record mm. it by the number of feedings or do you record it by how old it is? We can get into the semantics of that. Um, I think probably it has to do with its kind of origins and the fact that it's just so old, There's it definitely has some some strength to it that I don't see in Lucille. If I let Lucille sit for more than a month in my fridge um, and neglect her and don't feed her, she's so much slower. I did an experiment maybe a year and a half or so ago because people were asking this question and I let one sit in the fridge for maybe, I don't know, a month um, and then tried to feed it. And it took like two or three feedings to get her back okay. where Nona, I was able to neglect for like six months and in a single feeding, she was back up. Cool. Yeah. And um, question about sourdough discard. Yeah. What, what can you do with discard? I made oh, crackers at the discard. weekend. Yes. I saw all those. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. Um, but you know, what What else can you do? Could you make pizza dough with discard? So I have made focaccia with discard. Um, I'm sure you can make pizza dough with discard. So let, let me 
explain what I call discard because it's a little different than what other people call discard. I use a little tiny bit different terminology and I know it's confusing. I'm sorry. Um, us bakers use a little bit different stuff to me, culture, because I'm super nerdy, um, is what I call sourdough starter. I use those terms interchangeably, even like leaven. Some people call it, um, you know, builds like you have to do a, a build of a leaven before you start baking. I always call that culture. I call anything, oh man, this pizza smells amazing. I'm like really having a hard time not getting distracted by this thing. It's so good. Um, so I'll call anything that I fed over 24 hours ago, I'll call that discard. So once it's like settled back down, um, then that's what I call discard. Now that now gets extended out to like a month. Like I'll say anything that's like up to a month old is discard. If it's older than that, you probably don't want to make a discard recipe with it, revive it and then, and then go from there. So if you've got 24 hour old discard, absolutely. You can make pizza dough out of that. Like it's going to come right back. You'd feed it and it would come right back. It's the exact same thing you're doing in pizza dough. You're feeding it flour and it's fermenting and it's coming right back. The only reason why you feed before you start a, a new bake is just to make sure your, your leaven, your culture is really active before you start throwing ingredients in it and you can count on it being active. So that's why you grab it at its peak when the yeast is super active. So that's when you grab it and, and you're going to have more success doing it that way. But with this card, absolutely. I would say maybe increase it a little bit. Like if a recipe calls for a certain amount um, in grams of like a strong starter, um, maybe, maybe up it. 10 or 20% if you're using discard because the yeast is going to be a little bit less active. Okay. Um, but other than that, I mean, I use discard for stuff that doesn't need as much leavening. So um, Frick Oven Pizza just commented, Texas toothpicks. He gave me this idea, <laughs> which was incredible to just use it as fry batter. And so I wrote up a recipe. It's on my Instagram. I add a little bit of salt and a little bit of flour to it, um, but that's it. And then I dunk um, like an onion. I did a whole bloom and onion thing. I dunked a whole that onion in unreal. it. That looks it was so good. Dunk that all in, or in, in that and then dunked in the foam. So fry batter is great. Um, my all-time favorite is biscuits, which has a really different connotation in the UK. When I say biscuits, people just don't <laughs> understand. And I've had to like talk to people who, who have been to the South who like understand buttermilk biscuits to understand what I'm talking about. But like biscuits and gravy is one of my favorite foods in the whole world. Um, it's probably the worst food for you in the whole world, but I can see my breath. It's not that cold out here. I promise people. Um, it's Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> which is like last week was so pretty at this time. Yeah. The sunset was beautiful. Um, but anyway, I would say, how's the focaccia looking? Such a good question. I keep looking back yeah. to make sure it's not burnt. Yeah, it got a little bit toasty because I haven't been paying attention. Um, but uh -oh. no, 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 we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. That, that looks dark. But oh, it's, because, yeah. it, it's because the lighting out here is terrible. But no, that is not burnt. That looks really, really tasty. So uh, I'm going to finish that off. It's not burnt. Who just said it's burnt? It's not it's burnt. It's not burnt. Calm down. No, it's not burnt. So the, that <laughs> color that, that uh, people are saying looks like burnt, that's that... Um, because I can't find whole milk mozzarella here. So that's that like top layer of the mozzarella mm. um, that uh, has turned that color. Someone asked what that is. This is a Detroit style pizza. So I, I used um, a focaccia, my focaccia recipe, half baked it or par baked it, topped it, um, and then threw that uh, back in the oven and finished baking it. And my timer, to be fair, did go off a long time ago, but I've been talking, so I forgot to break I it I kept out. asking <laughs> questions, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. So, so a traditional Detroit style pizza would have pepperoni on it. Um, and I totally forgot to put the sauce on before I threw it in the oven. So apologies for that. Um, this is just a really basic red sauce, some oregano, um, and some salt and pepper and stuff in there. So I'm just going to throw that on top now. Um, and I should have cooked this would have brought a little bit more sweetness out of the acid from the tomatoes, but that's all right. Um, it's still going to be really, really tasty, but yeah. So this is a great little trick. I love using the oven. If you guys missed it, basically I stored a bunch of heat in the stone of the oven. Um, and then I let it bake with the heat off the flame completely off for 10 minutes. Um, and then I, uh, topped it, put it back in for probably too long, um, and let it go with the flame on low just to get some color and, and to get the ingredients to cook. So, um, I'll show you what that looks like with some sauce on it. I'm getting a little bit of light from like my outdoor solar light here. Let's see if we can bring this down. You can see, uh, there we go. Yeah, oh, there's some phenomenal. Light. yeah, there we go. So you can see those like crusty corners and stuff in there. If you can see those, I can grab some of this light. Um, so I'll pull this out. I'll go grab my spatula in a second, cool. pull that out and, um, we can have some pizza virtually. Um, so I did want to show 
the that next fold. So people, we, we did that one fold. I didn't want to show that next fold, what that looks like and, and how you can tell when your pizza or you saw your dough starting to look the way it should. Um, so let me pull you guys over here while you queue up the, the next question there, Christy. Cool. Um, yeah, um, actually just off the back of um, Discord, yep. what's, so, you know, a lot in a lot of recipes you get kind of dried yeast or live yeast. Um, yes. What's the ratio that you should swap out for, for sourdough? Yeah, so there's a couple things that you have to do here. So I just want to show you the thing I did before, which you can see there's like some, it's not perfectly smooth, right? Like there's some layers on top. I established my, my smooth side and my seam side on the bottom. Um, so this is what it looks like after the next fold. So I'll show you what that fold looks like. Um, so this is called a coil fold. Um, let me just bring you in here if I can. How's that look? Yep. You see that? Okay? Perfect. That looks right, good. Cool. So I'm just going to do that fingertip method again here really quickly. Um, I'm just putting my fingertips in water putting them together and that's it. That's all the water that I need. If you over water your hands, some people they'll show pictures of bread and they'll have these huge pockets um, of crumb. Um, that can actually be because you've used too much water when you folded oh, okay. your dough and it created this little water to water boundary uh, and the dough didn't come back and, and stick together. There's other things that will cause that too, some under fermentation and stuff. But anyway, so this is called a coil fold. Um, so you're just lifting the dough out and back towards itself and letting it fold onto itself and then putting it back down, turning it 180 degrees and then doing that again, pulling it out of the bowl back towards itself. So it falls in on itself. You can see the seam down there falling in on itself cool. and then back in 90 degrees do the same thing 180 degrees you do the same thing and then basically what you end up with is um and you do that a few times and you start getting a really smooth dough bowl this is 80 percent dough and i can lift this up out of the bowl and wow. handle it this is that same dough that was that sticky dough mess that a little bit ago and i'm literally pulling that out of the dough and i'm, I'm slapping it look at that like i can hold it it can fall it can stretch and it's that's like just slime. because i'm giving it time it it's very light it's i'm gonna make some uh focaccia out of that actually it's gonna be really really good <laughs> nice. um but that was that same dough. That's this is literally the same dough. It just has a head start. Like as this builds, like you can see it's tearing, right? And mm. you can see it's starting to build some structure. You just need to give it time and you need to coach it and give it a little bit of fold. So I would I could probably rush this fold actually. So Someone's... that same dough that I just showed you that was tearing. I'm just gonna do that exact same so method on it. Speaker Pizza is asking, what's the advantage of folding versus kneading? Ooh, that's an excellent question. Ain't nobody got time to knead. Um, <laughs> so like literally that was that exact same dough that wasn't smooth a second ago is now smooth from some really light um, structure build. So 80% dough, um, unless you're, I don't know, you have insane baker's hands, you're not going to be kneading 80% dough. Um, it's just not going to happen. So um, the advantage is you can work, you can build structure in really high percentage doughs. Um, now with, with pizza dough, that's around like 60%, you absolutely can need it. I was taught to need, um, and then give it time. Um, but I find that I actually get better structure out of my dough by just letting nature do its thing and giving it more time. And that's kind of going back to sourdough, um, and just letting nature kind of handle the business of the fermentation. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, the, the folds are just kind of guiding. It's just gently building that structure. Um, instead of mechanically stretching the dough over and over and over again to build structure with the kneading, letting kind of nature handle that part of it. This goes back to the question though with different yeasts. Yep. Um, so there's, there are some calculators online. The thing you have to remember um, is that sourdough has water in it. It's half water. So 100% hydration. Um, so there's equal parts flour and water. So there, there is yeast in it, obviously. I cannot remember the, the number off the top of my head of the calculator that I typically like to use. But if you, if you Google, oh man, what's the rule? I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I want to say, what is the standard? Oh, this is actually a good question. I know somebody's going to know this. The standard uni pizza dough recipe for um, like 500 grams of flour I, I want to say it calls for like five grams of yeast or something like that. Right? I think it's seven. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I'm in the ballpark. Great. So let's, let's yeah. call, let's call it five. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think you're right. The seven is for um, like a quick ferment pizza. You're right. Yeah. Seven grams. So if I do five, cause I want to go a little bit slower. So that's for 500 grams of flour. I would do 50 grams of sourdough. 
Okay. So I guess a general thing would be like 10x, but mm -hmm. that's that's really rough. Um, there are some sourdough culture, or there are some sourdough calculators, like I said, online. I would say around 10x, look for some sourdough um, calculators online to do the conversion, but look just for percentages. If like ballparking, I like to do 10% sourdough in my pizza dough. Um, it's a really easy number to remember and it makes good dough. So kind of maybe use that as a ballpark, um, the 10% number to kind of compare and look at maybe it's 10x. Okay, cool. Um, I feel really bad. You haven't had any pizza yet. It's okay. It smells so good. It's my <laughs> own fault. I I'm forgot gonna, that I'm spatula. Gonna let you, I'm going to let you kind of um, go and get the spatula, okay. chop it up and, and okay. have a bit. I'm going to do that. Okay. I'll, let Perfect. You, I'll leave you to the, the flames. Lovely. I'll be right back. Um, if anyone has any questions about Unico to 16, just um, fire, them, fire them away just now. Um, someone's asked about how long do you usually eat leave between cooks roughly. Um, Unicoda 16 has a super fast recharge rate um, just because of the L-shaped burner. Um, so, you know, like a, a few minutes in between, in between each pizzas and, and you'll be totally fine. It will still cook in your pizza in 60 seconds. So fire one in, leave it for a couple of minutes, check with the IR thermometer again to make sure you're above 400 degrees and then fire in another. Who's making pizza tonight? Not me, unfortunately. No pizza for me tonight. Um, Mike doesn't live that far away from me, but obviously with the social dis distancing rules at the moment, I can't have any pizza and oh, I'm very, very sad about it. So sorry. It's going to be a good one too. All right. So um, did I miss anything special while I was gone? Um, I just answered a quick question about Unicode to 16. Um, okay, cool. And I guess um, I can ask you another. So yes. once you make the dough, how long yes. should it be ideally be at room temperature before you put it in the fridge? Aha, uh -huh. so um, different recipes are going to call for different amounts of times. I traditionally like to say um, a good like four to six hours. Again, this comes back to kind of the point of how much time does code 16 have thicker stone? It does. Sorry. Uh, the engineers in me just like popped out when I saw the question. <laughs> um, so the, the general kind of timeline that I go with is around four to six hours. I like to teach to use a little bit warmer water. You're not trying to go much over like 25 C or like, uh, what would that be like 80, uh, Fahrenheit. Um, so you want to kind of stay in that ballpark around 75 degrees Fahrenheit around 22 degrees C is kind of where you want to be. Um, and I say like four to six hours, but those are my recipes and that's very dependent on like how much sourdough you're adding. Cause remember what you're trying to do when you're, when you're learning sourdough and you're learning baking in general is someone asked earlier if it's more of an art or a science, like it is definitely both like the science part of it, you have to understand, like you have to start kind of thinking of, of high school chemistry as much as you might've hated high school chemistry. Like you kind of need to start thinking about it in those terms, because once you start thinking about it in those terms, you start to think about, okay, well, how much sourdough am I adding? That's like my active ingredient. It's a chemical reaction. And then the warmth of my water, my liquid, the dough that it's in, that's going to determine how quickly everything happens. So if I've got less time and I really need to feed up some starter because I dropped the ball and I totally forgot to feed my starter. Um, I will put it warm water in it and I'll put it in a warm oven. I can't believe I'm admitting this, but I can get it to double in like four hours. <laughs> I shouldn't be doing that. Don't stress your starter out too much. Let nature do its thing. Have the patience, have the time, give it eight hours, or 12 hours with some cool water to really build up. But if you're in a rush and you need to do it quickly, um, you can do it in a warm oven, warm, not hot. The only ways to kill a starter are with heat uh, and it doesn't take that much heat. It's yeast and bacteria. Yeast and bacteria dies at like 180 C. You don't even have to put it in boiling water and it'll die. Okay. So just don't get it that hot. And then chemically. So if you put too much alcohol in it or something, you can't kill it. Um, and weakening it is you are killing some of those cells. So that's what's okay. happening when you're weakening it. So um, my recipes, like I said, I teach around four to six hours around that 75 degrees Fahrenheit, around 22 degrees Celsius. Um, that's going to give you the right amount of rise and the right amount of fermentation and structure build before then you do kind of your final shaping or whatever you're building, whether it's you're making focaccia or bread or pizza or whatever, before you put it in the, in the fridge, the fridge part is important part to sourdough. I might, might as well just jump into that really quick. Yeah, sure. um, so I mentioned earlier the difference between sourdough and, and just like yeasted bread. Um, 
the big difference there is the bacteria. That's kind of the whole point of sourdough. That's what gives it its name. Lactic acid bacteria, some people call it lab or LABs. Um, lactobacillus is like the technical scientific term for it. Um, and there's Saccharomyces, which is the, the yeast side of it. And then depending on where you live and depending on how you fed it, there's so many different strains of those two things that can be in it. Even some, um, I was talking to the sourdough librarian because I was doing a, um, experiment with like using naturally fermented, spontaneously fermented beers. Cause people have been running out of yeast. Um, mm. They want to make sourdough quicker. So like, can you, can you harvest yeast from beer to make sourdough? You absolutely can. I'm, I'm still working on that experiment, but um, there's some, those natural yeast and bacteria, there's so many different strains. My chat with the sourdough librarian is basically like, I've seen sourdough with not just lactobacillus, but other types of bacteria, uh, bacteria that make acid. Um, he said that he's seen some different types of yeast. There's one called Brett, Brettomyces. I can't remember how to pronounce that, um, but that's popular in some spontaneous fermented beers. Um, but anyway, the point is it's the two. That's what makes sourdough so important. It's both the yeast and the bacteria. Now, the bacteria needs some time. Bacteria is way smaller compared to the yeast size-wise of the cell, and it needs the yeast to chill out a little bit so it can go to work, and you make the yeast chill out a, bit a little bit with temperature. It starts to go dormant. Once that yeast kind of chills out, goes dormant, and the bacteria can get to work and start eating that gluten structure that you built. It's not bad as long as you don't let it go for too long, because it gets really, really difficult to use. As long as you don't let it go too long, the magic that happens in that time in the refrigerator, I like like three days for pizza. It's so cool. The sourness that comes out of it is subtle. It's not overly sour, um, but it's just a nice little extra flavor. But the digestibility skyrockets. And this mm. is one of the coolest things about sourdough. It's one of the reasons why I got into sourdough is something happens when you make bread the way you're supposed to make bread. It doesn't hurt your stomach. Yeah. And when you eat bread the way it's not supposed to be eaten, you have issues. And there's so I worked with people, a woman in tears has come up to me before and given me a hug saying she, her doctor told her she could never eat bread or pizza again. And she had my pizza and she went and sat in a corner. I'm not kidding. This is a real story. I was at a pop-up event. She had heard that sourdough people can, can uh, digest sourdough. She tried to bite. She went in the corner and she sat down and rolled up into a ball and just waited because I guess she knew that if it was going to react with her, it would react. And then she yeah. just comes up to me in, in tears and gives me a big hug um, because she was able to digest it. Some people have, a lot of people have digestive issues with normal manufactured bread products. I say normal because it's not even normal. It's not the no, way you're supposed not. to make bread. It's completely it's, yeah, processed it's, rubbish. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's rubbish. Oh, I love it. It's such a good British term. Rubbish. It's so <laughs> rubbish. good. Yeah, it is. It is rubbish. And so, if you start making stuff with sourdough, the lactic acid bacteria starts to kick in. It breaks down the yeast, or sorry, it breaks down the gluten. It makes it more digestible. Some people call it pre-digested gluten. It's easier on your own microbiome in your stomach to then digest that gluten that's coming at it. Um, and that's kind of the magic of this whole thing. And it needs time to do that. Manufactured bread products got popular, especially after World War II, because you can make them really quick. That was the whole point. You strip all the stuff out of the uh, wheat, all the good, amazing stuff that's in there for your body, strip that all out. You throw a bunch of Saccharomyces, a very specific strain of Saccharomyces at it to make carbon dioxide, and then you bake it. And you can pump out bread really, really quickly. The problem is once you started stripping all that away, you started stripping all the nutrition away, you can't just add it back in. It doesn't work that way. You strip the time out. You strip the lactic acid bacteria out and all of a sudden we're left with this bread that hurts our stomachs. Mm. And as people going to the doctor saying, I'm gluten intolerant and the doctor saying, yeah, you're probably gluten intolerant. You probably shouldn't have wheat anymore. And that's a tragedy because you can have wheat. You can enjoy it. There's so many people with gold butter issues or with joint issues. Well, I've worked with people who have, um, they break out in hives when they eat bread. Um, I've had people with hormonal issues when they eat bread from the yeah. store. But as soon as they eat sourdough, they can go and sit in the corner and sit there and know and their, it, their body and smile. feels different. And smile. Yeah, and exactly. Because this is amazing. Yeah. Speaking of smiling, I'm letting this pizza cool for way too okay. long. Okay, right. I'm going to let you fire into the pizza and okay. uh, I think we'll we'll wrap it up because um, that pizza needs to be eaten. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my wife has done a lot of work. Um, she really dealing, has. Dealing with the, the question. So oh I'm going to show word. you, I want to show you like just like the bottom of that, right? Like yeah. the color on that's incredible. Right. And that's, that was from the heat from the stone. Look at those sharp corners. It's amazing. 
it's pretty damn good. So that's that's from that. Yeah, that, that was yeah. that was baked in in Coda Sixteen Sharp Core. Oh, I love Detroit. Sorry. Nice. Oh, it smells amazing. Lovely. So, um, yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I hope that that answered the questions. We've been almost an hour. Um, that go, it goes by so fast. It's it crazy. does go by so fast. Um, so so fast. What, what we'll do is we've got a few more questions um, that have come in. So we'll answer them uh, over the next few days and we'll kind of post them somewhere. And we will let you know on... Um, oh, Sorry, just word. need to show. Look at that. This is oh, beautiful. I'm really hungry now. I'm not. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much. Yes, we'll, yeah. we will answer the questions. Thank you so much for everyone tuning in. At one point, it was just a whole mess of you. Thank you for someone. So my mom says she's proud of me. That's amazing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for everyone tuning in. We will get to the questions. I promise. Thank you so much. Um, please keep asking your questions. I know I'm taking a little bit longer. There's been an incre just a crazy influx of you asking questions. I promise I want to help you. It may take me a little bit longer to get back to you. Um, so please be patient on, on me looking at pictures of your bread and you saying, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I, I will get back to you. I promise. Um, Rose Hill Sourdough is the Instagram, rosehillsourdough.com. Uh, check out my YouTube page. I've got all these recipes on there as well. Um, and get an uni like, this is yeah. crazy. I started working for this company. I won't even go into that story. We'll do a different live and talk about how I found out about Uni and how I started working here. Um, Alicia would played a huge part of that and this pizza taste test program. I think that sounds like a, a fun live to do with that. Yeah, that I think it does. We'll, we'll get you guys back together again. Oh, me and Alicia. That yeah. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, Mike. Yes. And uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. And um, we'll have another live next week. Sweet. Thanks. Thank you guys. Have a bye great bye. night. Bye.